TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. Your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood. And with me now is your not so friendly neighborhood philosopher, the angry one, Mike Jones. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. <laughs> it's been a fun day. Fun day. What's what's been going on? Oh, you know, I have a. I'll be on my channel live again to respond to Daniel on child marriage because they uh, he doesn't he can't help but keep making it worse for him. He, he just can't help. So yeah, he's really digging in on this child marriage, right? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of creepy and a little scary, and yeah, they're making it worse for themselves. So I'm going through their stream Monday, and it it'll be fun. I can promise you, they uh they shoot themselves in the foot quite often. And, uh, yeah, I'll go through all that. Yeah, this is wild. And uh, me and uh, uh, me and AP, of course, have been talking about this sometimes with uh, with you in a stream. But it's uh, you've got the Muslims like Sajid and so on who are really annoyed at the route Daniel's taken. <laughs> and AP and I were talking about when it like Sajid probably has the exact same view. He just understands it's not it's not a good idea to to die on that hill. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> like there, yeah. there are all sorts of issues you could take your stand on right now. Um, <laughs> a child marriage. Wowzers. Wowzers. Yeah, and they just keep making it worse for themselves. And I'll, I don't care if it takes four hours. I'm going to I'm going to go through it all. Yep. Yep. Uh, all right. So what are we talking about today? Uh, well, I, I asked you to do a live stream because you posted a TikTok video. So um, we won't watch yours because we'll actually we actually have you here and you can just uh, explain your response. We will watch a video that you're responding to and someone who then responded to your response. Uh, so we will be checking those out and commenting on them and, and uh, going through some passages and so on and uh, giving people a breakdown on, on how logic works. Um, so anyway, <laughs> but, but, but give us an idea of the, the video that you were responding to and, and, and the, the topic, and then we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and take a look at it. Okay. It appears that some people have problems with definitions, and there's this big fad to say Jesus was a Muslim because he submitted to God. Therefore, we can call him a Muslim. And it's like, do you even know how words work? You just can't redefine words, make up definitions that are not the way you define words, and then equivocate on them. You just can't do that. And so that's what this guy does. He says that to be a Muslim means you submit to God. Therefore, Jesus was a Muslim, even though that every dictionary and encyclopedia on planet Earth does not define Muslim that way. Oh, yeah. Here we have an example. <laughs> Here we have an example. Uh, I don't believe this is serious. I think this person is making fun of uh, the the memes. Uh -huh. But uh, Jesus is Muslim because he <laughs> prayed with his head on the ground. Checkmate, Christians. <laughs> yeah, that that is the level of argumentation. Um, and uh, usually you just have to finish reading the passage. It, it, it's weird that they think like it, when someone wears a beard, they say, oh, you, you're becoming more Muslim. Like Muslims invented beards. And then if any anyone who prays bowing down, um, they say, aha, you see, that's how Muslims pray. So you're a Muslim when, I mean, my goodness, the, the pagans of Mecca prayed like that. So, so the pagans of Mecca were Muslims following the, uh, yeah. the argumentation here. Yeah. Jesus always prayed with his head on the ground, except in John 17, one, when he lifted his face up to heaven or in Mark eleven twenty five 25, when he says you, when you stand and pray. So yeah, he always did that way, except the times he didn't. Those parts were the, were the corrupted parts. No, it's, it's, it's. <laughs> It's it's this amazing situation where we've talked about this a, a bunch, but I mean, they could read a thousand pages of a book and every single line could be don't believe in Muhammad. And then they'll they'll fixate on the one on one line that they could twist into something to, in support of Muhammad. And they'll say, you see, this book supports Muhammad. And it's like, how are you doing that? They, they can literally read Muhammad. Verse one, Muhammad was a false prophet. Verse two. Under no circumstances should you ever believe in Muhammad. Verse three, anyone who marries a six-year-old and consummates a marriage at nine is a false prophet, right? You could go down the list. And then verse 17, something will happen in Arabia. Verse 18, <laughs> do not believe in Muhammad. And they'll go, oh my goodness, it says right there, something will happen in Arabia. This is proof. It's conclusive proof that Muhammad's a prophet. It's so, it's so interesting to me. Yeah, I, yeah it, is, it is interesting to say the least. 
Um, all right, so should we go ahead and check out this video? Yep, let's do it. All right, so we have, was Jesus a Muslim? And as far as I could tell, uh, so I, I, I went to the page to download it, and there were comments from Muslims saying, oh, you're so close to converting to Islam or something like that. So it sounds like this guy's not even, I mean, I, I only know this one video that, that you uh, were responding to, but it, it sounded like the guy is not a Muslim, and yet he's arguing that Jesus was a Muslim. The second clip we'll be looking at uh, is actually from a Muslim, but let's go ahead and check out this. Uh, this. And if there's any point you want to you wanna pause it, just uh, tell me to pause it. Oh yeah, no worries. Jesus was a Muslim, and here's why. The word Muslim means one that is surrendered or submitted to God. And what did the many works of Jesus do? He says, I can do nothing of myself. I can only do the will of the Father. I of myself can do nothing but only from the Father who sent me. And he said when he was at the Mount of Olives or Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, please taketh this cup from me. But overall, your will be done. He didn't choose his own will. He only did the will of the Father. This is the definition of what a Muslim is. And the word is... This is the definition of what a Muslim is. Nope. Right. Uh, that, 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 that. <laughs> yes, it is. He, he just said so. Anyway. Islam comes from the root word salam, meaning peace, and a silm, meaning surrender. And in Islam, they say that you attain peace only when you surrender and submit to the will of God. God bless you guys. Well, I officially feel dumber having watched that for <laughs> under a minute. <clears throat> yeah, right. if you notice, he went to a Wikipedia page and then he ignores the definition and goes to the, the part where it says how it translates as submitters to God, linguistically. Uh, now, when we get to the second video, the guy's gonna like really g dig into this and turn it into an etymological fallacy. But the way he's sort of wording it, seems to be an equivocation fallacy he is it if we're being charitable because when he says the word muslim means you submit to god that's not what the word means he has made up a definition based on its its uh linguistic heritage uh, let, let's and go, then let, therefore claim that that's what the actual definition which is false let, let's go ahead and pause for a second uh we, we we should do an entire like series we should collaborate on an entire series in, in, on introduction to logic but mm -hmm. just use Muslim arguments <laughs> to show to show all the all the fallacies. I, but so so the, the, mm -hmm. let's break down the equivocation fallacy for everyone out there. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, equivocation you're 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 using a word in an ambiguous manner. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you, you, the, the word can be used in multiple ways, and if you're if you're if you're taking advantage of that fact as you're trying to make a point or making an argument you're taking advantage of the fact that this word can mean multiple things uh you're, you're committing a fallacy so if you if, if you just saw me like gorging myself with food one day like it's ramadan right <laughs> like i'm just shoveling food in my face and you were to say suppose you were to say david what are you doing you're overeating stop doing that and suppose my response was well it's I'm in the United States of America. I have a right to overeat and I believe that I should always do what's right. Now, notice I use the word right twice, but the, the, even though it's the same, it's the same word does have two different meanings. It's very different to say my right. I have a right to do something that's very different from saying it's morally right to do something. Mm -hmm. So if I used that as my defense, you could say, ah, David, that's an equivocation. That is not a good defense of gorging yourself. That's a, that's a, that's a bad yeah. defense. That's an equivocation. One of my favorite examples is you, if, I, if you say this, it said, I saw a sign that says fine for parking. So I parked there because they said it was fine. Yeah. So you can see the word fine is used in a double sense. And so the way this guy is doing is he's using Muslim ambiguously. And then he's coming up with another definition that says it just means submitting to God. But that is not what every person knows Muslim means. And that's not what every dictionary defines it as. I mean, if you go through any dictionary, you're going to see like the word Muslim is defined as like, um, like Collins dictionary. Okay. A Muslim is someone who believes in Islam and lives according to its roles. Okay. Uh, for example, um, online etymology di uh, dictionary says what it, it says that one who professes Islam is the definition. Okay. Uh, Everything I can find, uh, you know, like Cambridge, Oxford, uh, Merriam-Webster, none of them defines it as one who submits to God. So 
what he has done is he has made up a definition that is just not well, he's not made it up he, he we know where he's getting it from he's taken mm -hmm. something and said this is a definition and then he just equivocates in an ambiguous way to say jesus is a muslim based yeah. on the actual definition of the word muslim you can't say jesus is a muslim that doesn't make sense yeah so it's a uh, it's technically so technically one who submits and therefore uh jesus submitted himself to the father and so he's a muslim uh but even even in its i mean in the islamic context it's it's submitting to allah and what does that mean well you have to submit in a particular way you have to right. submit uh in a particular way and so the, the the fallacy in all of this is um when you say jesus is a muslim that will be understood by your listeners in a certain way they will think you're mm -hmm. saying that Jesus is an adherent of the religion of Islam, right? And not that you're just making some point about the meaning of a word or something, a technical meaning of a word. So that's the problem. That's the problem. He's taking a word. He's taking a word. Uh, he, he understands how people will understand what he's saying and does it anyway, knowing that when people say, here, Jesus is a Muslim, they think Jesus is an adherent of the religion of Islam. Um mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, that, that's that's the ongoing problem. And so, yes, I would agree that is that is equivocation, um, even yeah. more so and even more so in the second video that we're going to, to take a look at. Well, to avoid the equivocation fallacy, this guy just he basically jumps ship and lands in an etymological fallacy. So you see this sometimes with the way people sort of make arguments, like they'll make a fallacy, you'll correct them, and then they'll try to make the argument again, but just in a different way, so they commit another fallacy. And that's what we're gonna see here. Um, was that John 5 that he quoted? Yeah, John 5, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, he quoted. <laughs> Why don't we go? Why don't we? Why don't we? Why don't we read a little John five real quick, just to show how insane this is? Uh, matter yeah. of fact, let me let me uh, let me go over to Philippians because note this is this is so interesting to me. A as I pointed out, they can read a hundred verses uh, in a row that completely contradict Islam, and then the hundred first verse is something that could agree with Islam, and they'll say, "See this 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 entire passage is conclusive proof that Islam is true." Uh, it's very interesting stuff. But let, let me uh, quote Philippians. <laughs> Suck your mic. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, let me quote Philipp. Matter of fact, we can do an entire logical fallacies course just in the on the lectures of Zucker Knight. <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, let me give Philippians two here just as an example of Christian theology. So this is Philippians 2, starting at verse 5. Paul says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God. Now notice, he's he's in, the na in, uh, in, in nature God, or in the form of God, depending on the translation. But he didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Now notice here, so some, he's, he's somehow God and somehow distinct from God. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Notice, he's in nature or in the form of God, but he makes himself nothing and takes the nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God, now that's interesting because, again, Jesus is God and yet somehow distinct from God. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And, at the, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. But there's also God the Father. And Jesus is distinct from God the Father. How did Jesus appear as a man, well, he took on the nature of a servant being made in human likeness. So once Jesus is in, has taken on a human form, he is a servant. And what's interesting in all of this is that any Muslim who uh, who reads about Jesus being a servant will say, ah, you see there, he, he's a Muslim. He's a Muslim. He's a, he's a, he's a servant. Uh, he's a servant of God. Not realizing, guys, we agree he's a servant. Mm -hmm. You... you my goodness, if you take the doctrine of the Trinity and 
the doctrine of the incarnation and the son becomes incarnate as Jesus of Nazareth. He is then a servant. You can't just say, ah, here's something about him in that situation that confirms Islam. Therefore, Christianity is false because Christianity views him as God. He, 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 he became incarnate and became a servant, ladies and gentlemen. So that's not inconsistent with God. We believe that. We believe he was a mm -hmm. servant. This is very, very strange. Now, so uh, you want to you want to you want to you wanna talk about anything before I, I take I take a look at uh, John five? No, I mean, also, John is very, very one of the most blatant uh, uh books in the bible that shows jesus is god you know, we'll talk about plays like john 8 58 john 14 uh jesus appearing to thomas the very first chapter of john like to say to use verses out of john to try to argue jesus didn't claim to be god is one of the most ridiculous things i've seen it's just a clear example of quote mining yeah and and, and, and yeah the, the book literally begins by calling jesus god mm -hmm. and then culminates with thomas confessing him as my lord and my god um, but somehow they'll just see the parts where Jesus uh, distinguishes himself from the Father in some sense. Um, or yeah, so they'll, they'll 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 focus on those and say, "You see, he's not God." This is interesting stuff. But this is one of the clearest places in uh, in the Bible among the quotes that Muslims use, where they're just obviously, as you pointed out, quote mining. The mm -hmm. entire passage can completely contradict Islam. They will zero in on one part that once it's completely taken out of context can be twisted into something supporting Islam. And they'll say, here's the proof. Zakarnak quotes John 5 over and over and over again. But look at what actually happens. So there are there are two there are two parts of this passage that Muslims quote. They'll quote verse 19 and they'll quote verse, verse 30. Let's go ahead and start a couple verses earlier and we'll do something they never do will finish verse 19. They, on, they only quote the first part of verse 19. They ignore the second part of verse 19. Why? Because it completely contradicts Islam. They literally cannot finish a verse that they're quoting because okay. it contradicts Islam. So let's, uh, er, earlier in this passage, earlier in this passage, Jesus heals uh, a man on the Sabbath. So Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. And then we get down to, let's start at verse 16 here. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. You're, you're not supposed to be doing work on the Sabbath, and they viewed even healings as work. Watch how Jesus mm -hmm. replies. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. So no, notice th that already sounds like a claim to divinity. He, human beings are not supposed to be working on the Sabbath. Jesus says, the father is working, so I'm working too. Right. Um, this is very, my goodness, I, this is the passage that Muslims <laughs> are going to quote. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. The next verse is, is very clear. John is adding commentary onto what Jesus means by uh -huh. this. And, you know, uh, he's going to know better than someone, you know, what, five, six hundred years later. Yep. Um, but Jesus answered them. My father. So j just so everyone knows, the the theological background is. Uh, it's understood Jews are not allowed to work on the Sabbath, but the rabbis had a debate on whether God works on the Sabbath, because you do have a passage saying he rested, but it means yeah. that that's rested in the sense of he stopped from, from what he was doing. But they had a debate because God is always upholding and sustaining the universe. So God works on the Sabbath if he's upholding and sustaining the universe. And so they have that debate going on among the rabbis. And then Jesus says, well, the father's working so I can work too. Exactly. So that's that really sounds like he's putting himself in the category of God, not of ordinary human being or or even prophet. In, in its cultural context, yeah, it's as John says in the next verse, he's making himself equal with God. And this is um this is a this uh, who pointed this out? I was reading a um, ah I can't remember what book it was. Um, I was reading a book where he was pointing out the um in its cultural context, this isn't the same today because. You know, someone's like my sons might go off and do anything and it might be completely unrelated to what I do. But back in that context, you generally did what your dad did. Right. If your dad is the butcher, you become the butcher because that's that's what you're going to be raised to be. If your dad is the carpenter, you end up being the carpenter. And so for for someone to say that God is his father who's working and he's doing it, it's like you saying, hey, I'm carrying on the family trade here. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's the work of God and not just random stuff. Uh, he's talking about even working on the Sabbath. 
But verse 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. That's how they mm -hmm. understood his claim. Hey, guys, I get to work on the Sabbath unlike you because my father does. And so th this, this presents a problem for the Muslims. They had their, uh, uh, their sons by the tons response where they say, uh, oh, OK, if G even if Jesus calls himself the son, there, there are tons of sons of God in the Bible. Sons by the tons. Yeah, uh, yeah, you can be a son of God in multiple senses. Don't commit an equivocation here, our Muslim friends, because as Jesus is using the son, he is the unique son. He's the divine son. So they understood him by saying that he can work on the Sabbath because his father's working. They understood him to be calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. But notice there's a, there's a problem here. He's making himself equal with God. It sounds like they think he's calling himself a second God who's equal to God, right? And what does Jesus do? He corrects this misunderstanding. This misunderstanding that he's claiming to be some sort of second God, some alternate God. So Jesus said to them, Muslims will quote the first part of this. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord. You see there, the son can do nothing of his own accord. Jesus is helpless. And, and, and then they, they, they stop there. The son can do nothing yeah. of his own accord. You see, he's, he's just a helpless servant. He, he's a helpless prophet. But notice, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. What? Muslims. Can any Muslim in history say, whatever Allah does, I do all the exact same things? No. <laughs> no. Nope. That, is not, that is not something a Muslim prophet should be saying. But what happens? The Da'is will quote the first part of that verse, say, you see, this supports Islam. They'll leave off the second part of the verse. Even you've got this father-son language, and then this is clearly not a son of God in the sense that, oh, we're all son, we're all children of God. It's not talking like that. This is whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. Right? So the father raises the dead. The son also raises the dead. And Muslims wouldn't technically have a problem with this, except the father-son language. But they would, uh, because they'll be thinking of it in terms of Jesus just miraculously raising a person from the dead. But no, he does not stop there. He does not stop there. Jesus is talking about raising the dead at the resurrection here in a second. Watch this. Um, for the verse 22, for the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son that all may honor the son, just as they honor the father. Whoever does not mm. honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Muslims uh, read verses 22 and 23 <laughs> very carefully when your when your dais quote this as affirming Islam, the father could, could, judges. What's that? Could you imagine a Muslim prophet saying that I deserve all the honor Allah deserves? Yeah. And notice Muslims, who's the, <laughs> who's the final judge of all, of all, of everything, ladies and gentlemen, who's the final judge at the judgment? A Allah, right? But this says that the father doesn't, doesn't judge. He's given all judgment to the son. So, and, and why does the father do this? That all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Why, in the name of common sense, would you honor a prophet the same way that you honor the Father or Allah or whatever you want to say? Why would you honor a mere prophet as you honor God? The only way, the only way you honor someone the same way you honor God is if that person has the nature and attributes of God. So is this confirming Islam? No. Whoever does not honor the Son, notice this is a massive condemnation. Of Islam. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Muslims, did Muhammad honor the son the same way that he honors the father? No. So Jesus condemns Muhammad and said he's not honoring God. Is This is the passage you're going to to support Islam. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. The dead will be raised because of the voice. They hear the voice of the Son of God. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Did you catch that, ladies and gentlemen? An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. Whose voice? The voice of the Son of God. Those who have done good, they come out to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Who raises the dead? Now, let me let me correct that. Muslims, according to Islam, who raises the dead at the resurrection? Allah. According to John chapter 5, which your da'is quote endlessly to support Islam, supposedly, who, who raises the dead at the resurrection? Jesus. So Jesus is Allah, according to this passage. A again, according to Islam, who's the final judge? Allah. According to this passage, who's the final judge? Jesus. According to Islam, who raises the dead at the resurrection? Allah. According to this passage, who raises the dead at the resurrection? Jesus. How in the name of common sense are you quoting this to support Islam? And here you have, so what, that's the context. That's the context of verse 30, which our friends quote to show that Jesus is just a devout Muslim servant. What's he say? I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. You see there, IP? <laughs> Jesus was a Muslim. He's, he's only come to do the will of the one who, who sent him. You see it? Uh. So anyway, that's what happens when we actually look at the context of one of these passages that these guys quote. Isn't this interesting? Yeah, Trying to use John to argue Jesus as in God is like trying to shoot a gun backwards, like the gun backwards, I mean, like you're just going to hurt yourself. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, this is uh, my goodness. Um, and it's really it's like it's like disheartening that we're dealing with. Uh, I mean, wh which which dais don't don't do this. W Muslims name a dai who does not do this, who does not just completely distort the meaning of passages in order to deceive his listeners. And what's amazing is you can show Zachary Knight doing something like this. So Zachary Knight quotes, mm -hmm. quotes, uh, quotes John 5.30 endlessly. You can sit down with a Muslim and say, okay, let's read, this in let's read this passage in context. What is Jesus actually saying in John chapter 5, verse 30? What was the accusation against him? Because he said that since the father works, he gets to work too. The accusation was, ah, you're claiming to be another God, you're claiming to be another equal with God. Jesus's response, Jesus' response is, what are you talking about? Um, his claim is that he's not some separate God. He's, he's one, right? Mm -hmm. he's, he's one with the father. So uh, th th you can think about this uh, differently and then, and then we'll get back to, uh, to the videos. Uh, but but the, all of that was to show. Think about if you were examining this as evidence, if you treated John chapter five as evidence, evidence that's either going to confirm Christian theology or Muslim theology. Now, it's possible that neither theology is correct. If you're just like approaching this philosophically and so on, you say, OK, there's Christian theology, there's Islamic theology, and then it's possible that they're both wrong. Doesn't seem possible that they could both be, be right. But the passage we read in Philippians 2, that's a good encapsulation of Christian theology. Jesus is in nature God, but he's distinct from the Father. He becomes incarnate, takes on the nature of a servant, right? So think of Christian theology. If Christian theology is correct, the Christian theology of Jesus is correct, what should we expect Jesus to affirm? We should expect him to affirm that he is divine, that he has a divine nature, but that he has entered creation as a servant and that he is distinct from the Father, and yet he's not a separate God from the Father. That's what you would expect Jesus to affirm if Christian theology is true. If Islamic theology is true, Jesus is just a, a created uh, prophet. Um, he's, he Allah's a father to no one. No one is a son of God. Um, Allah is the one who judges the the who who judges people at the final judgment. Allah is the one who raises the dead. 
and Jesus is, you know, he's, he's just a, a mere servant. Once we read this passage, which theology is being confirmed there? Massive confirmation for Christian theology, massive disconfirmation for Islamic theology. What do Muslim da'is do? They go to the one part, oh, I can, of my, I can of my own self do nothing. They focus just on that. They ignore everything else. And they say, see, this confirms, this affirms Islamic theology. Guys, is that a good method? I, I regard that as like insanely, massively deceptive. Like if someone made that argument, wait, to be clear, when, a, when an average Muslim makes that claim, I don't think the Muslim's trying to deceive me. I think he's never read the passage before. When right. Zakir Naik makes that claim, and Zakir Naik has read the passage, I think you are you are, you are such a deceiver. You, this is despicable. But this is despicable behavior. And they would never. You could you could line up a thousand Zakir Naik fans, explain this to all of them. N this wouldn't bother any of them. For some reason, they just don't care. But if you did that to them, if you ripped a verse out of context, completely distorted the meaning of the Quran, suddenly they care. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so now we've actually got a Muslim response to you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this this is the guy from a year ago when he was debating with me on the Song of Solomon, trying to say that it mentions Muhammad and accidentally quoted Song of Solomon 1. Oh, this is the same about guy. The woman. Yeah, it's talking about the woman saying he, that I am dark like the tents of Qadar. And then he was like, see, this is about Muhammad. And it was a this verse about, about a woman. the woman. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So, so just to be clear. That's this guy's level of understanding of the Bible. And he's the guy who's going to be responding to you. Yeah. And he, yeah. And again, it's like I said before, he jumps from the uh, equivocation fallacy into an etymological fallacy. To, to avoid the one fallacy, he commits another one. And then if, if he was arguing for a Muhammad in, uh, Muhammad in Song of Solomon 516, he's, he's also committing the, the phonic fallacy there and a number of other fallacies hmm. along the way, I'm sure. Uh, so this is... My goodness, guys, why, I, I can't for the life of me understand. Just to be clear, anyone can use a fallacy. We have all used fallacies at many points in our lives. In Islam, it's like standard accepted methodology. They just don't have a problem with it. Ex unless you're doing it to them, suddenly then it matters. But as long if they're using fallacies, fallacy after fallacy after fallacy in order to defend Islam, for some reason, it doesn't bother them at all. All right, should we go ahead? Should we go ahead and take a look at this? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Be prepared to have your minds blown, everyone. <laughs> because, so just to recap, uh, some guy made a video saying that Jesus was a Muslim because Jesus submitted to the Father. And IP responded, that is an equivocation fallacy. And our Muslim friend here, who's a super genius, is going to respond. Jesus was a Muslim, and here's why. Are you about to commit an equivocation fallacy? Oh, a uh, little pause, L little note. Uh, no one bother complaining about the volume levels. The guy's volume level just changes throughout uh, throughout a bit. Yeah, so I some 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 parts are going to be lower volume. Some parts are going to be higher volume. Live with it. There are worse things in the world. So don't cry to me. All right, here we go. Because it sounds okay. Let's see if you know what an equivocation fallacy is. <laughs> This is a guy. I literally <laughs> defined it in my video. I put the definition on the screen and read of it and explain how he's using the word Muslim ambiguously and then giving a different definition than how it's actually defined. That's literally an equivocation fallacy. So all he does is, well, let's just let it play because you'll see. This is just a myth. Well, it's, it's the idea, right? It's a guy that, I mean, you keep schooling him on the basics and then, oh, let me see if inspiring <laughs> philosophy knows what this fallacy is that he just defined in the video I'm responding to. <laughs> I know. Oh, it's so much. Uh, but, but, but notice, notice throughout this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've just noticed in Dawa, and we, we, we saw this uh, a, a few days ago when me and, uh, me and AP went through a video from Farid and Sajid. They both were amazed at Muhammad's confidence level and appealed to it as evidence. He's so confident when he says this, he must be right. He must be a true prophet. He must have <laughs> access to the divine. So notice, even though everything this guy's saying is nonsense, he says it with confidence. And that that's what persuades the audience rather than actually making any sort of valid point. Means one that is surrendered or submitted to God. As I said, this is an informal fallacy known as equivocation. 
This is where a key term in an argument is used in an ambiguous way. Wait, this guy's actually playing the clip of you defining the term yeah. to ask if you know what the yeah. fallacy is. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. With one meaning in one portion of the argument and then another meaning in another portion of the argument. In this case, you're defining Muslim with its ancient, very general sense in Arabic. Not how it's specifically understood today with its modern religious significance. So the word Muslim has a linguistic definition and a legal definition. Nobody is arguing that Jesus is... What is this with the legal definition? We're not even talking about a legal, legal definition. We're just talking about how the word is used. That makes no sense. Uh, the, I was not appealing to legal definitions. I was appealing to the dictionary definition like the actual definition of the word. Yeah, so uh, just in, in case anyone's tuning in, in case anyone's just tuning in now, here's the dispute. The word Islam just means submission. The word Muslim is one who submits. So since Jesus submitted to the Father, the Muslims are saying, ah, technically, therefore, he's a Muslim. And... But we know that when people hear Jesus was a Muslim, they're thinking, ah, Jesus was a follower of this religion, the same religion as Muhammad. And that's, that's, that's an equivocation fallacy. But that's what this guy's defending now. Let's go ahead and say, let me, in the matter of fact, let me back up just so that we mm -hmm. understand everything he's saying in context. Don't say, don't want to rip something out of context, ladies and gentlemen. Let that be a rule to you. So the word Muslim has a linguistic definition and a legal definition. Nobody is arguing that Jesus is a Muslim in the legal sense, meaning a follower of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Quran. Well, not yet, at least. When we say Jesus, Moses, jo wow. Joseph were all Muslim, we're referring to the linguistic definition. They were all prophets of God, so they surrendered their will to the will of God, making them a Muslim. Not once do we use the word Muslim in a linguistic sense in one part of the argument and then in a legal sense in the other part of the argument. That, that's literally what you do over and over and over again. <laughs> I, so now what he has done, and he's been appealing to linguistics, this is literally the definition of an etymological fallacy. You can't define a word by its linguistics. Uh, for, okay, let me just read from Kenneth G. Williams' uh, book on this. Okay, so etymological fallacy. This is a name of a much-practiced folly that insists that what a word really means is whatever it once meant long ago, perhaps even in another language. A classic example is the argument that the um, adjective diapidated should be applied only to deteriorating structures made of stone because its ultimate source was a Latin word for stone. Okay? He says basically, okay, and in this case, so basically what he basically points out is you can't define a word how it used to be understood linguistically in an old language or how it's defined by its uh, linguistic parks. The website Logical Fallacy said, okay, so a logical fallacy description, the assumption that the present day meaning of a word should be or is similar to its historical meaning. This fallacy ignores the evolution of language in the heart of linguistics. The fallacy is usually committed when one finds a historical meaning of a word more palpable or conductive to his or her argument. This is a more specific form of an appeal to definition. So he's literally he's committing and turning this into a, an etymological fallacy. You can't appeal to the linguistics of a word to define it. You have to appeal to actually is how it's defined in modern languages, modern dictionaries on the modern sense. So this is just nonsense. There's no, you don't open a dictionary and go, oh yeah, two meanings of the word Muslim here. No, it's always just one who follows the religion of Islam. Um, and as I pointed out, um, you can line up a thousand followers of Zakir Naik, explain all of that to them. They will not get it. You can line all of this guy's fans up in front of him. They will not understand what you just said, nor will they agree with it until you do the same thing in reverse. That's when they will suddenly <laughs> have an epiphany that there's a problem here. So ladies and gentlemen, let me go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and do this. You ready for this IP? Oh yeah. Here we go. You ready? What's a Hindu? Let's check this out. Let's go ahead and read through the uh, discussion here. A Hindu is a person who believes in the religion called Hinduism. That's the same thing you'll read if you look up what a Muslim is. A, Mus a Muslim is a, a person who believes in the religion called Islam. Uh, many Hindus live in India. Now, let's continue reading because we get a little background of the term. Use the term Hindu to talk about someone who follows the teachings and practices of Hinduism or, ha or who has a cultural connection to Hinduism. Why would you use it in that way? Because that's what the term now means. 
If you're a mm -hmm. Hindu, you belong to the third largest religion in the world and one with many different gods and goddesses. Now we get the background, the etymological background. The word Hindu used to refer to anyone from India. From the Persian word for India, hint. The ultimate root is the Sanskrit word Sindhu or river. So notice that part. The word used to refer to anyone from India. It's like if you say, so, you know, someone is from Africa, you say that person is African. You're not, co you're not commenting on their, their religion or anything else. You're just saying that's where that person is from. So the word Hindu used to simply refer to someone from that region, right? And you even have these listed as possible definitions. So definitions of Hindu, one, of or relating to or supporting Hinduism. So the Hindu faith. Two, a person who adheres to Hinduism. Three, a native or inhabitant of Hindustan or India. Now notice, those are very different definitions. The, the, this is a word that is ripe for equivocation, ladies and gentlemen. A person who adheres to Hinduism. That's how we normally use the word, a person who adheres to Hinduism. But the third definition is a native or inhabitant of Hindustan or India. So all Muslims who are from India are Hindus according to the third definition. Hey, hey, IP, did you no. know that, did you know that Zakir Naik is a Hindu? Oh my goodness. Well. Zakir Naik is a Hindu, ladies and gentlemen. Notice, here's what's amazing. If I walked around saying Zakir Naik is a Hindu, Muslims say, what, what are you talking about? And I say, ah, yeah, yeah, because the original meaning of the word is someone <laughs> from India. Zakir Naik was born in, in Bombay. That's India. Oh my goodness, Zakir Naik is a Hindu. Suddenly, Muslims would see a problem with this with this style of reasoning. Suddenly, it would occur to them, oh, yeah, that is stupid. That is a stupid, stupid, stupid form of argument. And yet, what are they doing? Jesus was a Muslim. Oh, you mean he's a follower of us? No, we're just saying that, that it means one who submits to God. And Jesus did that, so he's a Muslim. And then, then <laughs> they'll defend it. <laughs> And yet, if you were to if you were to do the exact same thing in reverse, okay, Zakir Naik's a Hindu, then they'll have a problem with it. Isn't that interesting? Well, do do they really want to go down this road? Because if they just if they want to say Muslim really doesn't mean someone who follows Islam, it's somebody who just submits to God. David, you're a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. Okay. And oh, by the way, we reject Muhammad as a prophet, but apparently we're still Muslims and we're never going to think the Quran is the word of God. But we're apparently we can still be Muslims. And if they go. Yeah, sure. I guess you can do that as long as you define it by its linguists, its, its linguistics, which is still a fallacy. Uh, okay, then guess what? Now the word Muslim has no meaning because anyone can just claim the word. Uh, a Hindu could claim it. A Jew could claim it. A Christian, a Zoroastrian could claim it. A uh, Sikh could claim it. I mean, like, what's the point at this point? You just, you define it to, to be such a vague term. It no longer has any meaning. It's like, what is a woman in ultra woke crowds? Like, it has no more meaning there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you could you could do this multiple times. Anytime you want to take the, the, the meaning of, a, you know, the original meaning of the word or the or the uh, etymological meaning and so on. Uh, but but the word Buddhist, that, that's an adherent. You know, that, that's an adherent of Buddhism, which is, you know, the, the followers of the Buddha. But Buddha just means enlightened one. Muslims. Mm -hmm. Was Muhammad enlightened? Do you believe that Muhammad was the enlightened one? Was he was he an enlightened person? Oh, OK. So he's the Buddha. Muhammad is Buddha. And you're <laughs> Buddhist. You, you should actually call yourselves Buddhists because you're the followers of the enlightened one. And, yep, and, and, you've heard of you your folks. Yep. All, all Muslims are Buddhists. All Muslims are Buddhists. <laughs> and, and, and IP, uh, this, I mean, we're sitting here laughing at this. this. Muslims, this is what you sound like to us. This is what you sound this, like to us. This is a, it, it's amazing that anytime I have to deal with Muslim apologists, I, the Dalagandas, I literally just am either laughing or face palming. And I'm like, this is the type of arguments I have to address. Can I get back to like real research eventually? Like, do I have to point out how ridiculous this stuff sounds? Yeah. And it's, it's just a sad, I, I told, I said, it's disheartening because it's like, it's this constant barrage of deception. And you're trying to clean up the, the messes that these guys are making in people's minds but when you're telling when you're telling their followers, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear how stupid this reasoning is. It's, wow, <laughs> so.
This is what yeah. this is just what Islam does, guys. Wow. Mm. All right, should we continue this video? Maybe he's oh, maybe, yeah. maybe he's about to make a powerful point in a sea <laughs> of stupidity. Uh, once is the word Muslim equivocated on in the argument. Let me back up just again, so we're not so we're not uh, we're not taking anything out of context here. I'll just back up a little bit. Prophets of God, so they surrendered their will to the will of God, making them a Muslim. Not once do we use the word Muslim in a linguistic sense in one part of the argument, and then in a legal sense in the other part of the argument. Not once is the word Muslim equivocated on in the argument. Rather, the linguistic definition is referred to throughout the argument. You are the so he's 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 saying just go with the linguistic definition. Okay, we'll just go with the linguistic okay. definition of Hindu as it was originally used, and completely ignore the religious significance of the term as it's used by everyone today. Isn't this amazing? Yeah. And this means, you know, because we submit to God, we're Muslims and we're responding to this Buddhist here. So we need to get mm -hmm. back to what this Buddhist was saying. All right. So now we have Muslims responding to this Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> who, who likes a, a Hindu named Zakir Naik. Yeah. Uh, m Muslims, I, I just want to point out when when you guys uh, use an argument, if that if if that argument allows us to say that we are Muslims responding to a Buddhist follower of a Hindu, <laughs> You probably want to examine your reasoning and tactics. Probably, you probably want to take a closer look. That is conflating the linguistic definition with the... I, did you just say conflating? Yes, <laughs> like, he did. <laughs> let me back up a little. This is cracking me up. Okay. Linguistic definition is referred to throughout the argument. You are the one that is conflating the linguistic definition with the legal definition you, and then projecting it back at us. Either you don't know what an equivocation fallacy is or you're being deliberately dishonest. See, either you're ignorant or you're deceptive, um, IP. Yeah, because the guy I was responding to definitely wasn't using the word Muslim ambiguously and uh, not properly defining it, but defining it in this other way. And all this guy, does, again, as I said, this is what happens when you deal with these arguments. If you point out someone commits a fallacy, the defenders still basically make the argument, just they just pivot and they just readjust it. So now it's a new fallacy. So now this guy's just made an equivocation fallacy because you can't define a word by its linguistics. That's an etymological fallacy. So to call Jesus a Muslim is an equivocation fallacy. No, you're just conflating definitions. He was a Muslim in the linguistic sense because he was a prophet of God and he surrendered his will to God just as Moses did, just as Noah did, just as Jonah, Joseph, all the prophets. He didn't yeah. choose his own will, he only did the will of the Father. This is the definition of what a Muslim is. No, it's not. It definitely is. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Where? That you got the <laughs> where you got what, the... he cites like what oh no i was just reading <laughs> oh okay yeah okay so okay again that's not the actual definition he doesn't quote a dictionary okay he, he doesn't do this he quotes uh what some islamic scholar just talking about submission i mean like again this does not show you what the actual definition of a muslim is this is Again, go to what the actual dictionary and encyclopedias do and how they define it. It's an adherent of the religion of Islam. And so, uh, yeah, and, and that's, I, I can't even believe we have to, we have to explain this. So again, guys, we could use the exact same reasoning that this Muslim is using. No, to a say, Buddhist. He's a Buddhist. Oh yeah, we could use the exact same reasoning that this devout Buddhist is using <laughs> To conclusively prove that Zakir Naik is a Hindu. Yeah, and we Muslims are pointing that out. Yep. Us, us powerful Muslims. <laughs> this is so ridiculous. This is, wow. The insanity you get from these guys. I just, I can't even like, it's it just, it's because it's just, you just gotta laugh at it at this point. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, again, if, if your if your argument makes David Wood and uh, inspiring philosophy devout Muslims, you, you got you got problems. Uh, and look, what, what's he got up again? What does he have up on the screen here, ladies and gentlemen? John chapter five, where Jesus claims <laughs> to be the final judge of 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 all humanity and the one who raises the dead at the resurrection and the one who says that you have to honor him the same way you honor the father. And if you don't, you're not honoring the father. This is the passage he's quoting to, to show that Jesus was a Muslim, but only, only in an etymological sense. Okay, great.
Moreover, these verses you pulled seem to contradict Islamic theology because Jesus calls God the Father. But doesn't the Quran reprimand those who say they are the children of God? I've already made a video on this, but Ibn... Oh, th now, this is, th now this is interesting. So th the passage over and over and over again mm -hmm. talks about father and son. And he says that he's made a video responding to that. We might want to actually... Uh, yeah, no, no, he, he explains. He kind of explains it here, yeah. Yeah. Your notes that father-son language is used throughout the Bible in a metaphorical sense and is not... Uh, 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 wait, wait, wait. <laughs> this is funny. I think he just cited Ibn Kathir. Because that, that is that is a common position um, uh, among Muslims who actually know that how the Bible uses these terms. They'll they'll say it was... Ibn Kathir says oh, it was okay back then because they didn't, they didn't know. But it's interesting if he's applying the same reasoning to Jesus. A video on this, but Ibn Kathir knows that father-son language is used throughout the Bible in a metaphorical sense and is not necessarily reprimandable when it was used before the revelation of the Quran, where it was abrogated from being invoked because of its idolatrous and polytheistic associations by the Christians. Okay. So he, he argues that it was, it was simply metaphorical. Mm -hmm. in, in the Bible. And there, there are definitely tons of uses of the Son of God language that would be metaphorical. Um, the, even in the, uh, even with Jesus, where he's the eternal divine Son, um, it, it's still not, it's, it's not saying that this is exactly the same thing as a, as a human father and son relationship. It, it, on the contrary, we're the image of God, right? The, 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 the father-son relationship, that is eternal. We're an image of that. Human fathers and son are, are an image of that, not us projecting what we are onto God. This is God creating us in a way that images or reflects his eternal nature. Um, but for him to say that this is simply meta, he, notice he'd, he'd, have to, he'd have to equivocate again using the word metaphorical, right? Because you wouldn't want to say it's literal father and son in the same sense as a biological sense in the, is the same as, as a biological father and son. So they would say it's metaphorical, but what's going on there. You're talking about Jesus being the eternal divine son. He clearly, I mean, he clearly says the father is working even on the Sabbath and therefore I'm not like you ordinary human beings. I work on the Sabbath too. Uh, the father isn't the one who judges. I am. He's clearly not saying, oh, you know, it's just metaphorical. Like, you know, God's our heavenly father or something like that. He's clearly he's clearly claiming to be the divine son. This is talking about a divine sense. Well, just go to John three sixteen. I mean, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And the Greek word there is monogene, which refers to some sort of unique, special nature mm -hmm. beyond just being metaphorically a son. John 14. Believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Okay, there's this special relationship there where they share the divinity. They share the glory. Same with John 17, 5. There's more than just this metaphorical language when Jesus is talking about it. So this contradicts Islamic theology when it says that, you know, that God is, or Allah is a father to no one. Um, I forget the exact verse, but it's that same kind of idea. In Christian theology, when Jesus is talking about his own sonship, there is a unique special relationship throughout the Gospels, especially in John. Um, so in, in notice in John chapter five, in John chapter, and as you point out throughout the gospel of John, uh, Jesus is presented as the unique son. He's a special son. He's not, he's not like other people who would call him. I, like I call myself a son of God, not in the same sense that Jesus is the, is the son of God. He is eternally such. And he is that by nature. He shares the same nature with God. He makes that clear in John chapter five. So if I were Muslim, I would just say, man, whatever happens, don't go to the gospel of John. They literally go to the gospel of John to defend the claim that Jesus was a Muslim. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's amazing. The way, it's amazing. Uses, the way you, John uses this, this Greek word, it's always to refer to the special uniqueness of Jesus. I use it in the first letter of John. He uses it uh, only, it only shows up in the Bible, I think about nine-ish times or so. Every time John uses it, he's only referring to this special uniqueness of Jesus. All right, let's see where he goes with this. And the Bible agrees that a name of God can be abrogated from being invoked, such as in Hosea 2, when Bali was abrogated from being invoked because of its idolatrous associations. Jesus also taught in the Gospel of John that no one can come to the Father except through him.
Yeah, this is no issue. Jesus was the Messiah, the messenger of God sent to the Israelites. How else would they get to God? Their rabbis? Oh, of course. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, guys, you heard it. We don't need to go through Muhammad or the Quran to get to God. We can just go to Jesus and the Gospels, I guess, apparently. Uh, should 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 we take a look at John 14? <laughs> I mean, if one of the most trinitarian places in the whole Bible. I mean... that, that, that that that's that's the that's the problem. You cannot understand the gospel of John apart from the doctrine of the trinity and the incarnation. You can't understand you can't understand John 14. You can't understand John 5. You can't understand these passages without the doctrine of the trinity and the incarnation. Um, but they'll just they'll just pick a little part out of it, and, and and ignore everything else in the rest of it. And it's just a why in the name of common sense would you guys go to the Bible, especially the book in the Bible that cannot be understood without the doctrine of the Trinity and the incarnation, and use that to affirm a religion that denies the Trinity and the incarnation. Oh yeah, it's 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 amazing stuff. Let's let's just go ahead and take a let's just take a little peek here. Let, 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 let's take a little peek here at uh, John chapter 14. Let's read a little bit here. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. You see, there's oh. there's God and there's Jesus. Ha ha, two separate. <laughs> it's proof. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Oh, that's interesting. Jesus is going to pre prepare a place for his followers. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yep. My, my Goodness. Notice, no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. So not even Muhammad can come to the Father except through Jesus. But also notice, I, I didn't, did he comment on the way, the truth, and the life? Because that would be regarded as blasphemous because those are names of Allah. Allah is the truth. <laughs> yeah. Allah is the truth. Right? And matter of fact, it, his, it, historically, heretical Muslim, like there was a, there was one Sufi guy who came out and said, uh, he just walked out one day. He was enlightened and he said, I am the truth. And they killed him. They executed him for claiming to be the truth. Because the idea is you can say, I speak the truth. You can't claim to be the truth because that is Allah. Allah is the one who is the truth. And so and so here's Jesus. And I mean, it's a passage where Jesus is claiming the divine titles of Allah. And a Muslim says, yes, of course. My goodness, this is amazing stuff. Now watch this. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Now this is interesting. Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Now, ladies and gentlemen, you have two different ways of understanding that. And this is where context comes in. If Jesus says, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What would that mean? Uh, that would either mean that Jesus is the Father or that he's somehow identical with the Father in some sense. Well, I mean, you can, there's a great book I always encourage people to read. It's, it's putting Jesus in his place, and they're actually coming up with a second edition soon. But what they say on page one, 103 is that the fullness of what it means to be God dwells in him and then they quote john 14 9. what is jesus basically saying the father is god and if you see in you know since there is this distinction if you look in the passage there's a distinction between jesus and father and then the father just like later we see there's a distinction between jesus the father and the holy spirit but what jesus is saying is look if you if you've seen me you've seen the father the father is god and i'm also god so if you want to see god just basically look at me like you would look at the father like they're basically saying that, yeah, we're both divine. We're both God. Again, this is a very Trinitarian passage. You have distinction between Father and Jesus, but they both are divine. And if you just looked at these, if you just looked at these verses and ignored everything else in the entire, uh, in the entire Gospel of John, you might say, oh, Jesus is claiming to be the Father. What's the problem with that? Well, he's repeatedly distinguished himself from the Father. So mm -hmm. think about this. There 
if I say, if you've seen me, then you've seen so-and-so, that could either mean that I am so-and-so or that I am in some sense identical to him. So notice, if I had a, like John McRae has a twin, they don't exactly look completely identical even more, but there was a time when they looked identical. And suppose someone came up to John, uh, John McRae and said, uh, and said, hey, I, I'd like to see your brother. John McRae could, could have said back in the day when they looked exactly the same, he could have said, hey, if you've, if you've seen me, you've seen my brother. Why? Because they would, they would be very similar in, in certain relevant way. If you've seen me, you've seen my brother. Why? Because we're identical twins. Um, so you could either read this passage, if you ignored all the rest of the, all the rest of the scripture, you could read this passage as Jesus claiming to be the father, or you could read it as Jesus saying that he is uh, identical to the father in some relevant way. N notice what we saw in John chapter five. Jesus was saying that you have to honor him the same way that you honor the father. Why would you honor someone the same way you honor the father if he has the same nature and attributes? So Jesus over and over again is claiming to share the nature and attributes of the father. How how can a Muslim read this and say, oh yeah, that lines up with Islam perfectly. This is really weird. This is really weird that, that they go about this. Uh, but watch, let's go ahead and read a little bit more. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? So notice he's drawing a distinction between himself and the Father. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe on account of the works themselves. Now watch what happens. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is Jesus claiming that he's the one who answers your prayers. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Mm. So you, you pray to God in the name of Jesus, and Jesus says he's going to do it. This is a this is is this a mere human prophet claiming that he's the one who answers your prayers? And so this notice notice the problem that we have, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Jesus claims that he can answer prayers. He claims multiple names of Allah as applying to himself. He claims that he is the only way to the Father. And then after all of this, what do we have? We have <laughs> we have. Uh, Verse 16, and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. And Muslims say, you see, that's Muhammad. <laughs> I love that one. It's, it, you gotta it, be isn't, isn't, me. isn't that amazing? Like, that, like after all of that. And then, and then Jesus specifically says, he's talking about the Holy Spirit and they'll say, that's Muhammad. So you've got father, son, and Holy Spirit is Muhammad. <laughs> and they're saying, they're somehow claiming this lines up with Islam so perfectly. This is amazing stuff, man. Again, when do I get back, get back to real research and stop debunking just obviously bad arguments? This is really, really bad stuff, man. Um, oh, I guess yeah. I, I guess there was a little there was a little bit of that video left. Let's go. Ahead oh no, yeah, please play it. Yeah, Jesus was the way to God. He wasn't God. And he pre-existed. Let, Let me back this thing up. All right. Jesus was the Messiah, the messenger of God sent to the Israelites. How else would they get to God? Their rabbis. Of course, Jesus was the way to God. He wasn't God. And he pre-existed with the Father and came from heaven. So, the Prophet Muhammad <laughs> peace be upon him said that <coughs> and he pre-existed. So, <laughs> wait, finish playing it. Like, let's just finish him getting his thought out. Let me back this up. I want, I want, I want that full thought on here. All right. <laughs> Jesus was the way to God. He wasn't God. And he pre-existed with the Father and came from heaven. So, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that when Adam was in clay, he was made the seal of the prophets. And those who have seen him have seen the Father. Was Jesus the what? Father? No. This is figurative speech. The Quran says that he who obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah. Is the messenger Allah? No. This is figurative language to show the unity and will between God and his messengers, because they were Muslims. This is interesting. It's interesting <laughs> that he's not saying corrupt or anything. He's saying, oh, yeah, it's just figurative language. So he's agreeing with it. He's, he's agreeing with these claims of Jesus to be the only way to the father and to pre-exist. And oh my goodness, I don't, I don't think this guy would have a problem with calling Jesus God. He said, yes, of course, in a figurative sense, he's God. Yeah. Yeah. He opens the floodgates here to all sorts of weird things because 
again, the way gospel betrays John is that he is unique in the sense of his divine nature. He is the one who's going to judge and raise life at the resurrection. Jesus claims, I mean, how would he deal with John 8, 58? John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. If you go to the Septuagint, you go to Psalm 92, it says, before the mountains were, you are. Okay, now if you just take out mountains and you put in Abraham and then you make this, you make that first person, you get the exact same Greek phrase of what you find in John 8, 58. So basically Jesus is just making the first person statement of what you read in John in Psalm 92 of the Septuagint. Like this is a direct claim to be God, to be the creator. I mean, like, I don't understand how you can get around this sort of language. When you read John, and then when you read John 14 in context, you see Jesus is claiming far more than just being some metaphorical son. He's claiming a unique status beyond what anyone else could proclaim. Um, and notice the ongoing problem here is that he's saying, uh, yeah, Jesus is is making all these claims about himself, but they're, they're just figurative. They're, they're just metaphorical. But he compl he says that the reason Allah had to abrogate those uses is because uh, Christians started interpreting them wrong. But notice, why do Christians believe that Jesus is the divine son? Because of these things that Jesus said. So according hmm. to this guy, Jesus is saying all these things that are constantly making people think that he's claiming to be divine when he's actually not. He's just using figurative language. So notice this isn't Christians later misinterpreted. The people who were there listening to him were interpreting this as claims that, that he's divine, right? It, you, you pointed out John 8, 58. Muslims will look at that and say, ah, oh, what he's really saying is, wait, the people who were there picked up stones to stone him to death for blasphemy because of this. The, the real question, and this, this, is the, this is the overall problem. You've got Muslims saying, ah, Jesus makes all of these claims that really sound like he's claiming to be God, that he's claiming to be the divine son of God. He's making all these claims. But what he really means is all these other things. The question is, Muslims, why would a Muslim prophet be saying things that people are interpreting as him claiming to be divine? Why is he making claims that make him sound like the final judge of all humanity if that's not what he was claiming? Why would he make claims that make him sound like he's the one who raises the dead at the resurrection if that's not what he's really claiming? Why would he claim titles of Allah if he's not claiming to be Allah? Why would he claim that he can answer prayers if he can't because he's just a mere he's just a mere servant? Why is he making all of these claims which over and over and over again make both his followers and his critics think that he's claiming to be divine. Is that what a Muslim prophet does? Does a Muslim prophet come out and say, I'm going to use all these insane metaphors to make it really, really sound like I'm claiming to be God. And I'm going to do this all day, every day until they want to, until they want to kill me. And my followers are bowing down and worshiping me. I'm going to do that. And then 600 years later, someone's going to come along and say, oh, you just misinterpreted everything. <laughs> it will also, I mean, Jesus was talking to them. He's going to use language that they understand. Why is he going to use language that they're going to inter misinterpret constantly and then only l later muslims are going to somehow get right like he's not talking to generations hundreds of years later he's talking to the jews of the day they understood him to be claiming to be divine to be equal with god so why aren't we interpreting jesus's words in its cultural context we got interpreted in some later islamic context it's like if i said today i'm Baal, you would think i'm crazy and claiming to be a god but if you go back to like the iron age Baal just meant it could mean husband. It could mean Lord. It didn't necessarily mean that you were referring to yourself as a deity. So, you know, it's like if I if I claim, like, why would I go around saying I'm Baal? And then people go, how could you claim that? No, I'm actually just claiming that I'm a husband. No, no, no that's not how that works. You got you to gotta use language. You're going to use language that communicates your message to the people you're talking to. Jesus is doing the same thing to his disciples and to the Jews of the day. And he's using language to point out. He is the unique son of God that shares in the glory and the divine nature with the Father and the Holy Spirit. If you go down to verse uh, 15 and you just read from there, it says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father. He will give you another, the helper, who will be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be with you. Then Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while in the... The world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You also live. In that day, you will know that I am in the that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. So here we see 
very Trinitarian language. There's a distinction between the Holy Spirit, the Father, and Jesus, yet they're all in each other in the same sense of divinity. So the Holy Spirit can come, dwell within us, and that's the same sense as Jesus dwelling in us because it's the same God. So again, I don't understand how they could look at this and, go, and have to make all these convoluted ad hoc uh, ways to just make this all not be Trinitarian. When you read John 14, 15, and 16 in context, you get a very strong sense of Trinitarian theology. And <clears throat> one ongoing problem, I mean, if you're going to, it's one thing to say, don't believe the Bible. The Bible's been corrupted. That's one thing. It's one thing to it's, a, it's something else to say uh, the Bible's been corrupted, and we're going to go to certain verses of this corrupted book and claim that this proves our religion. That, that that's something else. That's that's weirder. Uh, it, it's another thing to say, uh, yeah, I agree with all these claims in the Bible. I'm just interpreting them uh, metaphorically and figuratively to agree with me, even though everyone who was listening to him interpreted them as him claiming to be divine. Again, if, if a Muslim prophet is stepping out, saying a bunch of things, and both his friends and his foes are interpreting him as claiming to be divine, you got a problem. Because what that means is Jesus was an, a horrible, horrible communicator. That's what mm -hmm. Muslims are telling us. They're, 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 it's one big insult. <laughs> See, they think they're defending Jesus. They're, they're insulting him. They're saying he was a moron. His followers were morons. <laughs> Uh, he, he, he didn't know how to communicate what he actually wanted to communicate. And notice it would have been very easy. Stop calling yourself the son of God. If you don't want people to think that stop claiming the divine oh. attributes for yourself. If you don't want people to think you have the divine attributes, stop claiming that you can answer prayers. If you can't actually answer prayers, stop saying all of the things you're saying. And somehow our, our Muslim friends don't see the problem here. Yeah. And even when he claimed to be the son of man, consensus of scholars will say this goes back to Daniel 7 because the son of man there's a divine figure who comes riding on the cloud something only God can do and is given a kingdom and dominion forever uh, this is very much constantly claims to divinity some sort of equal status with God and again throughout the gospel of John just clearly you see Jesus constantly saying he's got the same powers he's got the same privileges as the father it, so it's, it's a shame we have to keep pointing this out Yep, we got some serious, serious problems here. Let's go ahead and uh, I backed it up a little bit. Let's see what he says. It's obeyed Allah. Is the messenger Allah? No. This is figurative language to show the unity and will between God and his messengers because they were Muslims. Gospels in context, okay. you find numerous tensions with Islam. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then is it okay for Muhammad to claim that I am the way, the truth, and the life, that before Abraham was, I am, that, um, you know, I descended from heaven, uh, th these kinds of things that, um, you know, I will raise them up uh, the last day. I am the resurrection of the dead. Uh, I, you know, the, John 5, I have, uh, if you honor the Father, honor me in this. Likewise, like, would that, would that be kosher for Muhammad to say all those things? Uh, yeah, and it, it raises the further problem. If you can say all of these things, I mean, if this guy, let me put it this way. If Muhammad is considered the pattern of conduct for Muslims, then I'm assuming they would consider all prophets patterns of conduct for people. And so if Jesus is walking around claiming to be the son who will raise the dead and who um, who will be the final judge and who answers prayers and who's he's the one who sends the, the Holy Spirit, who apparently is Muhammad and so on. If you can say all of these things, and it's fine as long as as long as you're being metaphorical, then yeah, I mean, not just Muhammad, but we could say these things today too, right? We we won't because we don't we don't want to commit blasphemy. But according to according to our friend here, any a Muslim, well, not us, but Muslims in the actual sense of the term, uh, Muslims could go around claiming to be the way, the truth, and the life, and and this and that, claim to be able to answer. And, just, and if you challenge them on that, just say, I'm just it's all metaphors, just a bunch of metaphors, ladies and gentlemen. Just a bunch of figurative well, language mean, when I'm saying it. Can we just say that about the Quran? Like anything we don't like is just metaphorical language. That's that's just... the problem, right? If you could use that, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, we could act. We could do the same thing with the Quran, ladies and gentlemen. We could say, we agree, we we Christians, we agree with the Quran, but we're going to go through there and we're going to interpret anything we don't agree with as metaphorical, and then we're going to twist it into something that agrees with us. Somehow, mm -hmm. Muslims would spot a problem then. <laughs> But they don't when they're doing it with the Bible. Interesting. The rules, there, there's no concept of consistency in this religion. Nope. All right. I think this is the final point because there's only 20 seconds left.
yeah. theology. Therefore, Jesus doesn't qualify as a Muslim. None of the examples you gave were irreconcilable with Islamic theology, and it wouldn't matter because we believe the Sharia <laughs> differs from messenger to messenger. Jesus was a messenger of God. He submitted his will to God, so therefore he was a Muslim. Nobody is arguing oh that he God. is a follower of the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Conflating definitions does not change that. Again, this is still an etymological fallacy. This Buddhist keeps making that. It's it's really unfortunate, and we Muslims have to come out and point this out. Again, you can't define a word by its linguistics. That's not how words work. Words change over time. The way that certain words are now defined is not according to linguistics or historical definitions. So, again, you go to any dictionary, any modern dictionary that define the, defines the words Muslim, it's not the way he defines it. It's always an adherent of the religion of Islam. And again, if they want to go down this road, then they've just defined Muslim into such vague terms it no longer has any meaning. We're Muslims. Hindus are Muslims. Anyone who submits to God or claims to submit to God can qualify as a Muslim. Therefore, when they claim to be Muslim, it has no meaning anymore. If that's what they want to do, fine, but they're basically just destroying their words. Um, you, you, you might want to... Uh... <laughs> We might just have to have to have to roll with this and start saying, um, <clears throat> start saying that that we are Muslims, yeah, and, <laughs> and then going around and then uh, and then saying, but now we've adopted a new meaning of Muslim and we're we're no longer Muslims and therefore we're ex-Muslims and then they really hate it when people claim to be ex-Muslims, and so uh, yeah. Well, I'm just going to start calling all Muslims Buddhists. I mean, I think that's just fair. Yeah. I, and, then, uh, <laughs> and then when they complain about that, you can point them to that video and say, no, I'm, I just, you, you've persuaded me with that reasoning. And since you all cheered him <laughs> on when he said it, therefore I'm using the same reasoning and so on. Yeah. If they, if that's what they're going to do from now on. Then we can do the same thing and just call them Buddhists. If they're okay with that, then. I mean, again, that, again, this just, it, it, it's like, it almost reeks of a little postmodernism in that like words just no longer have meaning. They can mean whatever we want them to. They're no longer defined by the way they actually are in society. We're just going to define them into total vagueness and therefore anyone can claim to be a Muslim. And, but this is what the depths they are going to try to say Jesus is a Muslim. Yeah, this is, uh, I'd say this is, things are getting pretty desperate if this is the route, if this is the route they're they're going in. Um, but I mean, what, what else do you expect from the, the online Dawah guys? The, I mean, this is, this is, this is what they've been trained to do by the likes of Zucker and Ike and so on is, uh, just keep ripping things out of context, keep distorting the meaning of things. And, uh, and anytime something in the gospel of John doesn't fit what you mean, it, you just interpret it metaphorically. Uh, like I had to respond to some guy who in John 20, for example, he was saying that when Thomas says, my Lord and my God, he was actually talking about the Father. He wasn't talking about Jesus. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, this is like this, the depth you got to go to, the ad hoc reasoning. You got to constantly keep adding context that's not there to make it fit with your theology. It's just absurd nonsense. Yeah. What? What? I mean, one, that doesn't make any sense. It's actually more common for, for Muslims to say, ah, he, he's just, he's, shouting that in shock he's saying oh my god <laughs> and they don't realize guys just because people in the world today see something and they go oh my god they think what you think first century jews did that they would take they would take that as as taking the lord's name in vain no they did not they did not use that as an exclamation uh first century jews did not use that as an exclamation of of shock when when thomas calls jesus my lord and my god it's because he's realized something. He's put it all together. He just rose. Conf Jesus just rose. He's appeared to me, which confirms all of his sayings. What has he been saying to us all along? Oh, he's been making claims where he's the divine son and he figures it out. He puts it all together. Wow. All right. Uh, we got a, what happened to the Jihad Tears mug? It's right here. It's right here. It's just, uh, I, I keep one for water and I keep one for coffee. Oh, I was just going to say on John 20, Mike, Mike Lacona points to Psalm 35, 23, where the psalmist says, my God and my Lord uh, talk. He doesn't, he doesn't start talking about a completely different God mm -hmm. or changing subjects. He's clearly talking about Adonai, the God of the Old Testament. If you compare Psalm 35, 23 with John 20, 28, it's this similar grammatical structure 
Thomas is telling is saying Jesus is his Lord and God. Indeed. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that that takes us through the current state of Dawa on TikTok. <laughs> And it re- it oh really it really seems IP like what the situation is is they're 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 recycling the same old arguments and so on, but they're targeting them at a younger generation on TikTok, knowing that that there are still tons of people on TikTok who don't know any better and who haven't been exposed to the refutations of their points, and that's why uh, uh, that's why it's good that you're on there uh, doing that. But ladies and gentlemen, probably need some more people out there uh, going on. TikTok to refute the same arguments that we've refuted over and over and over again because it just it just takes it just takes time to get a message across. I All right. TikTok's actually been a little bit better lately, by the way. They're not as hard as they were like in 2022. I've not had any as nearly the issues I had last year. So I think something must have happened with their trust and safety team and they're not flagging as many videos as they used to, so it's been getting a little better. All right. Well, are, are we uh, are we uh, are we all ready to wrap up here? Oh yeah. Let's wrap all up. right, ladies and gentlemen. I believe I'm going over to uh, House of Hikma after this. Going over to House of Hikma here. Let me let me insert the link for anyone who wants to follow us over there. Uh, House of Hikma is a channel run by uh, some tiny little kid. Uh, he's like twelve. And he's he's getting interested in apologetics, so we want to encourage these little twelve-year-olds <laughs> to to uh, get involved in apologetics. As you know, we need people to reach the younger generation. So, uh, all right, well, ladies and gentlemen, so we looked at a pretty uh, pretty common claim to claim that Jesus is a Muslim. There are all sorts of things that you could mean by that. You can believe that he's actually an adherent of Islam. If so, we would need the evidence. We we need more than just Muhammad saying it. Um, so some of our friends try to prove it from the Bible and it looks like you only get that result by, by significantly distorting some things and ripping things out of context and fallacious reasoning. So I I would say that if your position requires fallacious reasoning, you probably need another position. All right. Thanks IP. And the link to IP's channels in the description box. If you're not subscribed, you definitely want to subscribe and check out his content. And also, matter of fact, I didn't I didn't include a link to your TikTok uh, channel in there, but I will I will add that tonight. So if you're watching this later, uh, either either just go to TikTok and look up uh, Inspiring Philosophy, uh, but also I'll have that link in there as well. All right. Catch you all later. Hope to see some of you over on uh, House of Hikmah.